everyone. Thank you for joining us over your lunch hour. My name is Jen Bowen and I'm the Artistic Director of Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop. I'd like to welcome all of you, especially the poets at Faribault who will watch this from the inside in the coming weeks. MPWW is honored to be teaching a class with the poetry of Reginald Dwayne Betts, Natalie Diaz, and Randall Horton, whose books were donated by the Million Book Project. We're especially honored to welcome these poets here today on behalf of poet Sun Young Shin and her students. Sun Young will introduce the poets and serve as moderator for this event. After I share a little, about, a little bit about Sun Young, we'll turn the hour over to her. Sun Young Shin is the author of, author of three poetry collections, Unbearable Splendor, Rough and Savage, and Skirt Full of Black, all with Coffee House Press. She's the editor of three anthologies of prose, what We Hunger For, Refugee and Immigrant Writers on Food and Family, which launches tonight, by the way, and we'll drop that info in the chat. Um, a Good Time for the Truth, Race in Minnesota, and Outsiders Within, Writing on Transracial Adoption. Her fourth book of poems, The Wet Hex, will be published by Coffee House Press in June 2022. And she is also the author of two books for children. With fellow immigrant poet Sue Wong, she co-directs Poetry Asylum in Minneapolis, where she also does body work and community healing. Please welcome Sun Young. Thank you, Jen, and thank you, Mike, and thank you everyone for being here. Welcome, friends from Dakota land and about a mile and a half south of George Floyd Square. Hello to our MPWW students, you are all missed. We are all really looking forward to when we can see you again and be together in study and writing. And to those of you in the audience today, and especially to our featured poets, Dwayne, it's been a privilege to teach your work in my course, um, Apollo and Dionysus, the poem is a dialectic of force. It has been a total dream team of books and of authors. And um, it's just been, it's been really a blessing. So thank you so much for your continued work. Um, for those who aren't aware, MPWW has been receiving boxes and boxes of books as part of the Million Book Project, started by Dwayne Betts, a project that harnesses the power of literature to counter what prison does to the spirit. Reading is a dignity affirming habit that we do to strengthen our sense of self and to discover our authentic interests. The project's mission is to build a 500 book freedom library and place it in prisons in every state in this country and Washington DC and Puerto Rico. Those curated libraries promise to build community both amongst those incarcerated and the prison staff and between those incarcerated and their friends and family. Dozens of authors will enter these prisons as literary ambassadors to discuss their work, beginning a conversation that breaks down the walls through the power of words. So with that, let's get the conversation started. I will share bios and then we'll jump in with readings. And after each poet has read, we'll take questions first from the Faribault students. And if time permits from you all in the audience, that would be lovely. Reginald Dwayne Betts is a poet and lawyer and the founding director of the Million Book Project. There are a lot of things he believes are important, but on some fundamental level, what feels more significant than the books he has published and the awards that he has won is that he's helped get three men out of prison who he served time with and is working to get others out. His books include his latest poetry collection, Felon, the memoir, A Question of Freedom, and two previous collections of poetry, 
Shahad Reads His Own Palm, and Bastards of the Reagan Era. In 2019, Betts won the National Magazine Award in the Essays and Criticism category for Getting Out, his New York Times Magazine essay that chronicles his journey from prison to becoming a licensed attorney. He holds a JD from Yale Law School and is pursuing his PhD. Natalie Diaz was born and raised on the Fort Mojave Indian Village in Needles, California. She is Mojave and an enrolled member of the Gila River Indian Tribe. Her first poetry collection, When My Brother Was an Aztec, which you know changed my life and many other people's, was published by Copper Canyon Press in 2012. Her most recent collection, Post-Colonial Love Poem, was published by Grey Wolf Press in 2020. She is a 2018 MacArthur Foundation Fellow, woo, a Land and Literary Fellow, and a Native Arts Council Foundation Artist Fellow. She was awarded a Breadloaf Fellowship, the Holmes National Poetry Prize, a Hodder Fellowship, and the Penn Civitella Ranieri Foundation Residency, as well as a U.S. Artists Ford Fellowship. Diaz teaches at the Arizona State University Creative Writing MFA program. And Randall Horton. Randall Horton is the author of the Poetry Collections 289-128, Dark Anarchy, The Definition of Place, and The Lingua Franca of Ninth Street. His memoir, Hook, was the winner of the Great Lakes College Association New Writers Award. Horton is currently a professor of English at the University of New Haven. He's received numerous awards, including the Gwendolyn Brooks Poetry Award, the B. Gonzalez Poetry Award, the Great Lakes College Association New Writers Award for Creative Nonfiction, and the National Endowment of the Arts Fellowship in Literature. In 2018-2019, Randall was selected as Poet in Residence for the Civil Rights Corps in Washington, D.C., a nonprofit that challenges systemic injustice in the American legal system. So thank you so much. Please let's welcome our guest writers. I know everyone's clapping behind your rectangles. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and please use the chat to show your love and uh, support for our community. So we're going to read in that order with Reginald Dwayne Betts beginning and then Natalie and then Randall. So I will pass it to Dwayne. Thank you so much. Cool. No, it's my pleasure. I'm gonna read a, a few poems. I think I'm gonna read some new stuff just because, um, just because. So this is like, I'm gonna read one book from the, one poem from the book, and then a few things that's a work in progress. Uh, Temptation of the rope. The link between us all is tragedy. And these so many years later, I am thinking of him, all of twenty and gay and more free than any of us might ever be. And this is one way of telling a story. Another one is aphorism or threat, which is to say that surviving that young and beautiful and willing to walk every day as if wearing sequins meant that there's always something worth risking doom. There's no reason for me to think of him now, especially with the football player's hanging body eclipsing another prison. Except maybe the kid whose name I can't remember, but walk I can, had mastered something the dead man's singing legs could never. How not to abandon the body's weight and how to make the body expand, to balloon, to keep becoming until even the danger could not swallow you. One day I watched him full of fear for my own fragility and wondered how he dared own so much of himself openly. For all I know, every minute in those cells was safe for the kid whose name I cannot recall. But how can a man ever be safe like that when you are so beautiful, the straight ones believe it and want to talk to you as if they love you and want you to dare them to believe some things in this world must be far too lovely 
to ever be broken. All right, I'll read a few more. You know, I'll, I'll read a few more. We only got 10 minutes, so I got a lot of stuff I would say about the poems, but instead of saying those things, I shall just read them. Um, I shall say one thing. I've written these weekly, just weekly poems for a friend. And I think it's something important about making a commitment to write a poem for somebody else. Uh, every poem feels like a, a message. And a lot of poets imagine they write messages to the whole world, but I imagine how powerful we might be if we chose to like write a message to just one person we cared about. So I'll read a few of these. Canary, on a corner of a street whose name I cannot remember, is a canary yellow Cadillac Coupe de Ville. I have always wanted to sing. I've always wanted to be able to seduce a crowd with the treble in my voice. In mornings when I drive by this song of the past, I'm struck by how often I slow, as if seeing is touching or climbing behind the wheel and returning to that one moment that might have changed it all. As a child, I wanted this car as much as I wanted to carry a note. Something about desire frightens me. I learned to love that car and then learned that DeVille is a French word. I didn't expect to land here where I am telling you that I have no home. To admit that I've learned to belong in what meaning comes from a canary yellow car that never moves, but reminds me of times when the baggage I carried was expectation. A lover once told me that everyone deserves to expect something and she closed her eyes and sighed. I drive by that yellow version of my yesterdays and know that there's always something to want, to long for, to hold so close that it makes you sigh as a good memory might. Out back, daisies and crocuses, and flowers I cannot name in this heart that science says weighs 231 grams, of which would fit in my hand, this hand that has held a pistol once, and two children that call me father. The flowers make me wonder about beauty, how a year ago I had not known they existed. In the same way the heart's Ventricles confuse me. That entire engine of beauty and joy. I'm so much better at knowing the things I've held in my hands. So much better at expecting those beauties. But my God, when the flowers have erupt from the earth in surprises of pink and purple and red, and something the old lover once called viridescent, the lock box in my chest flutters. And I am surprised to know how surprisingly lovely things remind me of a first kiss. Uh, all right, I'll just read a couple more. A collection of anything. A group of almost anything has a name. Crows are murder and flamingos are flamboyance. Most of the others I don't know. A group of empty shot glasses is called a disaster. Of empty rooms, a yesterday. A collection of tomorrows, even if simply dreamed, if desired, if craved for, like some small child wanting one more story at bedtime. It's called hope. There were too many nights when all I had was hope. There is no real collective noun to hold all the people you love. If we name it at all, wouldn't it be abundance? I have an abundance of loves, and even when I am lonely, especially then, they show up. Outside, it rains, and inside, everyone I love is asleep. There is no word for what it means to listen to them breathe. But if there were, 
it would be the antithesis of murder. Crows always remember a face, is what I read once, and can recall as if a part of a dream. And so I've always thought a house full of loves is a dreaming. And what better word for listening to all your loves breathe at night than dreaming? What more can any of us ask of the night? Thank you. I'll stop there. That was incredible. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I cast the spell. Uh, I'm just super starstruck by the three of you. I just want to say, usually I'm I'm full of shenanigans and saying nonsense, but I'm not. And we have <laughs> we don't have a lot of time. But um, I'm just yeah, blown away. Thank you. Amazing. Um, Natalie, happy to hear you. Thank you. And Cassius for having me, um, Jen and the team for all your work and Sun Young for your generous introductions. And of course, I was lucky to start my day with uh, Dwayne, Reginald um, and Randall. So I appreciate it. Uh, I'm gonna start with a new poem. So I'll follow Dwayne's lead. Um, and Dwayne was talking about groups of animals. So uh, one way to talk about a group of, of rabbits is as a colony. So I'm gonna start this. Uh, my timer here, just so I don't, yeah. Um, and I'm trying to shift what is, who, who's good, who's bad here, so. Colony. The coyotes are on the beach, vacuuming tonight's terrible light with their eyes. They puncture the river sleep with holes of blue-green eye shine. The river rolls over, awake. The coyotes are baptizing the rabbits, dunking them in the shallow water. The rabbits play dead in the coyotes' mouths, but jolt and cry out when they break the water. The river is cold and they shake the rabbits. I've never seen a rabbit swim and no rabbits will swim tonight. The river, because it is the scene of their crimes, the river, because it will clean us of what the rabbits have done. The rabbits are not from here. They come from another territory of night, from a different moon. The rabbits are white, which is not a color, but how fast it twitches. The rabbits disappear our women. Maybe not these rabbits yet, but rabbits like these and soon. White rabbits as call and response, a multiplication. The game where everyone holds hands, then someone squeezes, sends a signal, and everyone sends the same signal they receive. If that game were forever and played by rabbits, rabbits so white their eyes are pink. The rabbits took my cousin. They collapsed her down to a greasy spot somewhere. Like when your brother backs the truck out of the driveway and the truck leaves behind an iridescent liqueur on the ground. So you sprinkle sand over it to absorb the stain. The coyotes are a night shift, a labor of shades against the pebbled shore. They are a range of blue black mountains reorganizing weight, a dusk. With more night happening, the rabbits become stranger. Their ears are slicked back like men. I try not to ask myself, what is a rabbit? I can't explain the rabbit, but I feel it. I've felt it my entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. I don't know what it is, but it's there, a white blot in my mind. The question distracts me and a rabbit kicks its body free. The noisy shadow tangles and disrupts the coyote's feet. One of the coyote's shape transforms. It opens all of its mouths and recaptures the rabbit. At first, the cry of a rabbit is the cry of a baby. Then the cry becomes something there are no words for. The cry of a rabbit will make you cry unless you are hungry or the rabbit has pulled your cousin out of your life by her hair. 
The coyotes plunge the rabbits into the river four times. One of the rabbit's ears flap in the wind like empty violet shirt sleeves. Each time they are sunk in the water, the rabbits become more quiet. The silence embers the coyote's eyes copper, chrysocolla. Some of the rabbits hang upside down, staring off and soothed by the moon, who is also soaked with river and whose light trickles out from the middle of the water to the shore in tremors. Wounds move this same drenched way. The mesquite trees along the jetty are tap rooted in the water. When you gash a mesquite trunk or cut its branches, its skin seeps red gold sap, weeps and crusts an amber blister. The rabbits wish to begin healing, but their wounds are happening now. The rabbits wish to cicatrix. Rabbits are always too late. The rabbit's cries have become choked with water or the coyote's teeth, most likely with blood and fur, a burbling. The river and its bullfrogs are also sounds. A fish leaps from the water and falls back into it. I should have said the rabbits were screaming, not crying. I am the one crying and on nights like this, everything is wet as tears. The coyotes move in a group. How mourners move around a pyre, how authorities move to the door of a family whose daughter or mother has gone missing. Not a tight pack, but a breathing. How fingers brush one another on their own hand. The coyotes' tails are down. The rabbits aren't saying anything anymore. They were another kind of quiet before this, before the screaming. The rabbits have never wanted to talk about what they have done. This rabbit quiet is a new quiet. Tufts of pale fur rock in a foam onto the shore, then off back to and off again. It never settles. The coyotes clean the rabbits with the river and clean us of the rabbits. They lick the terrible light from one another's faces and eyes. But what the rabbits have done is still done. The coyotes know this and cry the spilling moonlight back to the moon. The moon crusts and closes. The coyotes leave the beach one at a time. We are all clean and lonely. And then I'll finish on a last poem. Um, yeah, so this is a song that samples from um, the Yeah, Yeah, Yeah song called Maps. And then, uh, then Beyonce also sampled that for, uh, for her song. So you might hear some of that, some of the language from uh, Maps, uh, Don't Stray, I'll Say, Say, Say. Um, and then of course the title. I also didn't know any of, like what any of the words were to this song until like a few years ago. <laughs> so I'd like, I realized I made up all the words to it. Uh, I had no idea it was saying Maps. They don't love you like I love you. My mother said this to me long before Beyonce lifted the lyrics from the yeah, yeah, yes. And what my mother meant by don't stray was that she knew all about it. The way it feels to need someone to love you, someone not your kind, someone white, someone, some many who live because so many of mine have not and further live on top of those of ours who don't. I'll say, 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 I'll say, 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 what is the United States if not a clot of clouds, if not spilled milk or blood, if not the place we once were in the millions? America is maps. Maps are ghosts, white and layered with people and places I see through. My mother, has always known best, knew that I'd been begging for them to lay my face against their white laps, to be held in something more than the loud light of their projectors as they flicker themselves sepia or blue all over my body. All this time, I thought my mother said, wait, as in give them a little more time to know your worth. 
when really she said, wait, meaning heft, preparing me for the yoke of myself, the beast of my country's burdens, which is less worse than my country's plow. Yes, when my mother said, they don't love you like I love you, she meant, Natalie, that doesn't mean you aren't good. And I'll stop right there, so gracias. All right, can you hear me right? Okay, good, good, good. Great work, and um, thank you, uh, Minnesota uh, Writing Program, for uh, having me. You know, I have a love affair with you guys. Uh, <laughs> and I want to thank Jen, too, for uh, just inviting I me, mean, exposing me to all of this uh, early on. And we did some work with um, the poet uh, when she was on the inside, Louise, with Kayagan. And it's so great to see her out. And so, yeah, I just love, love you guys for everything that you do, right? So, I'm gonna follow suit with from uh, Reginald. Um, I never called you Reginald, Dwayne. <laughs> and uh, I was like, who the fuck is you talking about? <laughs> I did the same thing because I saw his name up there and I was like, Dwayne, wait, Red, wait, we gotta be. <laughs> I'm like, Reg Mr. Oh, Reginald Dwayne. Dwayne. <laughs> right. I'm gonna okay. go ahead and change that. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I'll read a couple of newer, newer, new poems I'm sort of working on. So we'll see how that ro rolls and then. I'll end with 289128, some poems from there. So, um, Survival Chronicle 5011, and it begins with the um, epigraph, the past, an uncorrectable measure. Amongst the body politic, however, did I survive those dilapidated streets in the deadpan of winter. As if awakening from a dream, I did in the continuous live feed, walking amongst wanderers. Questions are all. Questions are complicated to a chronic condition. Hung in this inverted setting, the powerless possess power up to a point, the point being point blank, a forty four long. Morality is often a trick bag. Still underneath the surface, can a shadow dance at night? The Great Disappearing Act. The boy grows up in a post structural box. A perfect how to erase someone blueprint, race and the imagination. Color does not fade. In a cell, stir or white or solid gray. Four walls, brick or concrete, form a container to contain. Or we begin with and or make a case. Or more specifically, black and brown bodies are tied to a terrible condition, always as disposable trophies in a winding staircase. I'm gonna read a couple of things from 289128, right? Um, some of the Subway Chronicles. I'm gonna skip around um, and read like three or four of them. Subway Chronicles. One, flashback to the cell. The last stop is also a beginning point on the sea at 168th. Poetry is hard, catches my eye before we depart against the reflecting neon signs as square tiles parallel lives live in a box for sale. We alone, the man and I have no significance until he exits. The grinding wheels pull away from 155th, a ghost compartment now analogous to time spent in solitary. I occupied this same mute hush when white boy met his living shadow in a split second on the cold concrete, bringing to view faces pressed inside rectangle glass. The after sound resonates loud year after year. White boy died from the epistles of dear John. Appearing in 125th, a person is reading the essential Etheridge night. On the train today, no one reads and we continue swath in noise. Four transfer eight sil eight silver poles down the aisle a toddler hangs limp onto her mother doors close a drone nonetheless carries for two minutes us in which time an armenian commuted text love forever cannot be defined beige pentagon tile blue metal columns the platform arrival block numbers display 96 we exit the film poster, the white faced woman featured prominent as backdrop, her black mane backwards, vertical, endorsing the film, the quiet ones. Yet, impending train break, breaks grime, 
against rail and stop doors open we begin uptown east next stop 110th blinks overhead a nomadic figure materializes shouting over the pa system in another life your murder self be more alive than dead 10. Exiting, exiting darkness begins the, excuse me, 10, as in 289128, the protagonist. Exiting darkness begins the process by which, of course, I dissolves, dim, opaque, and a train whistling by the last window starboard. Against plate glass, bubble the cheek, but then oblique as in, press ever so silly, dumb the night. Vibrant and uptown folk trapped in a maze of boundaries and books. The soul of black folk, or so thinks our protagonist. No matter totally recuses itself from the living. It begins dream as manifest destiny. There's departure and arrival, trapped in, a, in an impossible construct. Say the construct walks upright in search of freedom everywhere, a historical fallacy willing the body. Say skin construction is black, deepening the, scene, the scene's projection. Let's call 289128 human. Now I end with this one, it's called um, Walking with Ghosts in Harlem. The paperback entered through the slit, man child in the promised land at count time. After bag and baggage one night in a bar, all those images rushed back over laughter beneath a congregation of drunken voices. What did it mean walking with ghosts unseen to the neck in this dark minute demands? There is the scent lingering will not leave. Must stop the clanking inside won't stop. Rock while it's jaw jacking uninterrupted in the yard on Sunday. A circumference around the track again in one airplane fighting cumulus clouds breaks free. Chained to the past a corrective measure. Looking for salvation in books I once wrote. Down these mean streets save me and Sonny within the esophagus of justice about prison. The protagonist returns through a windowless sunset of tragedy, having seen skylines etched in haze. There are walls packed behind this freedom, undiscovered and yet too real each day. An electric fence around the neck echoes, metal, metal rattling long hours stretch either way, subject to a condition. A pass, a dagger through the heart, cannot kill. Now in there, thank you. That was incredible. Thank you so much. I just want to say, um, because no one is about to stop me, that these books are just like I experienced them all like stigmata. Like they're the 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 way that these writers give us, you know, the body and soul as um involuntary sacrifices in these systems is it's incredible and even though she can't be here with us Dion Brand I'm also teaching ossuaries which is just the most epic beyond um vision you know truly visionary please please read these books um teach them yeah thank you so thank you so much Dwayne Natalie and Randall just um prophecy yeah, so we have these beautiful questions from one of our students. And so I'm gonna start with those if that's okay, that's in Faribault. Um, the first question is for Dwayne. I often think of the books that have influenced me the most in my life and how the books change as time goes on. I feel books are a fundamental need for a prisoner, just as food, healthcare, and therapy are fundamental needs. Thank you for helping so many of us. Which titles have you selected for the Million Book <laughs> Project? <laughs> and how are they chosen? <laughs> or just maybe highlight. He was like, the, the, the question was like, yo, let me, let, me, let me drop some jewels on you. And then let me ask for some secrets. Um, so I haven't, I haven't revealed the books for the Million Book Project, but I deeply, agree with that sentiment. I can reveal a few though. I can reveal a few that I haven't revealed yet. Um, Post-colonial is on the list, of course. 
Uh, Randall's new book, Dead Weight, is on the list, um, which is not out yet. Uh, and then also, I, I'll, I'll just reveal some books in a... I'll randomly reveal a few. I'm not supposed to tell anybody anything, but I'll, I'll tell you guys because you asked. Um, and then I'll tell you some things that I love that may not be on the list, and, I, and I'll tell you why. But uh, on the list, I'll tell you about this thing that we did, which is Freedom Suite, and it's books in the public domain. I started a publishing company called Fats, Juvie, and Luke, named after three of my friends I served time with who, um, who I helped get out of prison, uh, representing on parole and supporting on that clemency petition. And one of my homies came home and died, and so I wanted to create a footprint for them that existed in the world. And so we wanted to publish a series of books in the public domain and have uh, like some contemporary writers write introductions to them. Um, the past is not prologue. It might not even be the past. And one of the ways to remind us of that is to engage with those works. And so um, Pride and Prejudice, Jane Eyre, Heart of Darkness, Great Expectations, Narrative of Life of Frederick Douglass, uh, the Souls of Black Folks, Middle March, Scarlet Letter, Dubliners, The New Negro, Moby Dick, Paradise Lost. I mean, these are books that many of us have read that have stayed with us. The Pitch of Dorian Gray. Uh, you know, The Million Book Project is a really impressive project. Uh, we got a small staff, but uh, Tess Wilwright, actually the, our project manager, has been like sort of central in helping us figure out what these books would be and why we were choosing them and who would be writing the introductions. And so you got uh, George Saunders, Jamaica Kincaid, Marlon James, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones. Uh, you have uh, just a, a, a basic bevy of the brightest lights of contemporary writing. Disha Filiar, who are like writing about these books. And we believe um, that these introductions will say something that's uh, Alexander Chi. <laughs> Yo, this shit is wild, right? It's a, it's, it's, it's like a, a, a bunch of contemporary writers who are kind of building a bridge between those older books and the current moment. Uh, Nicholas Davidoff, and so I'll give you that slate of sixteen, seventeen books. It's a lot of contemporary books, though, you know. And and, and the only reason I'm not naming them now because if you remember, if you're old enough to remember the source, when 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 the album got five mics, you were waiting to see if it got five mics. Well, I'm holding back on revealing it so you could wait to get at me about what you love that's not there. Um, but I, I, I expect that when you see the list, you'll see what you love. And hopefully you'll see what you thought about going to that you hadn't had, you know, like a opportunity to go to, especially for people inside, but also for people outside. And, um, and ultimately, it'll be a journey. I mean, this one wild ass book that has the word cheese in it. That's a book of history. And, and like, you just wouldn't believe it exists, but it's a beautiful, well-written book about how we come to knowledge. If you can figure out what that book is, I will actually give you the entire 500 book suite just by telling me what that book is. Um, all right, so the, that has been thrown down in these poetry streets. Um, thank you. The next question is for Natalie. Or deep, just yeah. You have a style that uses metaphorical images to define and describe suffering. What is your process of moving from pain into the world of metaphor? I feel metaphor is sometimes the only way to understand reality. Therefore, the ability to use metaphor has evolved and is built into our brains, just like the ability to do math is part of the brain structure. But unlike most math, there are many possible ways to create metaphors. What I'm wondering is how you do it. And after creating, finding metaphor, does it then cause you to understand your experiences and also your loved ones in the world with more clarity? That's a good question. Um, I think a lot about metaphor, actually, um, because I it's a structure that I think helps us to shift our, our realities or unravel our realities. And I also don't believe in it at the same time. I think that all of these things are possible at once. Um, and of course we build, we build structures of like intellectual structures so that we can, you know, like, like poetry, for example. Um, but I think with the metaphor, one of the things that it allows me to do, which poetry also does. So I'm, I'm right now I'm embracing the idea of metaphor. Um, so we're all like 
clear on on what we're talking about. Um, but it can hold it can hold more than one thing at a time. Um, and so the question that I'll pluck from uh, from this question is about um, metaphor in relationship to loved ones. And and I think love is such a complex thing. Um, you know, we have a single word for it, but it's a million different ruptures and uh, you know fractures and uh, abrasions and softnesses and tendernesses. Um, and the idea of the metaphor one, it lets me be more capacious. So for example, I write a lot about the brother um, in my work and the real life relationship I have with him is a difficult relationship. Yet under the scope or under the structure of metaphor, which allows both the brother and me in the poems to be more capacious, to be in disagreement, to be in a kind of tension, to both be wounded, uh, to both be capable of wounding, to, you know, so suddenly I think violence um, becomes something more than violence. It becomes uh, uh, almost a natural condition. You know, love can be a kind of violence, a, a soft touch can be a kind of violence. Um, and I mean, some of this comes also from, I'm from a storytelling culture. And so the stories I learned growing up are more true than some of the American stories I've heard. You know, so all of these things are, are possible. Um, but I guess in terms of making the metaphors, uh, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm image driven. Um, you know, when I am trying to say how I feel, I think of an image before anything. Um, and I guess that that's what metaphor is to me. It's, it's at once a structure by which I can be more capacious and hold difficult things, complexities. There's no solution in a metaphor, I think it's, um, and at the same time, I think it also uh, allows me to, to recognize that the stories I've been told in the English language, the way the English language works is, is not capacious enough. And I need to to break it, to rearrange it, to reorder it, so that uh, so that I can love difficult parts of my own life and existence. Um, yeah, in this country, that's a very fractured answer. Um, but I I appreciate the the question about metaphor because it's something I think a lot about. Thank you. It was really beautiful. Salma Sharif came to Minneapolis a few years ago, and someone asked her about. Um, metaphor and she said basically like I don't believe in metaphor um, that you know I'm not going to use a metaphor for a tank because it's it's not a metaphor um, and this, this whole crowd of poets were a little bit astir um, but it was it was I mean a really good it was a really good talk yeah, thank you Kim writes a lot about metaphor also which um, you might want to dip into she came and had a conversation with us recently about metaphor so. yes for Randall, I know a writer's voice is frequently talked about. When I read your poems, it is as if I can hear your voice saying the words out loud. I'm wondering if before you physically write the poems, if you first hear the phrases in your head. I think for many writers, this happens simultaneously or said differently, the words are in our minds and we aren't even aware until we've written them down. Can you speak more on the voice in our mind that allows us to create a unique voice in our writing? That's not difficult or existential. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to hear the answer. Yeah, that's, an that's an interesting question. Wow. I mean, but it's actually got me thinking about, you know, my whole process. Um, you know, in terms of writing and voice, voice is huge for me. Um, and 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 I want and that's that's good that someone can actually sort of think about my voice in a certain kind of way when they hear me work because I'm actually thinking about it myself. Um, and and how I you know so you know Baraka asked the question how you sound, and I'm always interested in how I sound. Um, but this get but but going getting back, I think my whole process begins long before I write the poem. I'm thinking about where I'm thinking about situations, phrases, things, concepts, you know, working them out in my head. Very rarely do I sit down, unless I'm doing a writing prompt with my students or something like that. Nowadays, do I sit down and just sort of write just off the cuff like that? It's a process where I might go through, think I might I might be thinking about something for weeks. Um, just a you know situation, um, even my you know things within my own life that I'm trying to wrestle with. 
um, or even and it may be even longer than that. Um, but at the same time, I'm all I'm very aware of like the idea of language and, and what it can produce on the page and in, in the structure of it. That's why a lot of times you see most of my poems are very tight or they'll be spaced out. And I'm thinking about them in certain kind of ways. I'm trying to give the reader some kind of direction in how to read my work. Um, and um, and I think the voice or whatever it is that comes out, I hope that it's sort of like you know, a, a, a sort of a long extension of, of my body, uh, of, of the things that are going on with me and in, in, in my language, because I'm always thinking about these things. I'm thinking about line breaks. I'm thinking about, you know, short phrases and what they're going to be saying, how they're saying them. Um, and it just, be, you know, so it's, it's a long process and it begins long before I ever come to the page and with me sort of, somebody would, somebody recently, I mean, one time a person really told me something that was interesting about a poem that I had written one time. He's like, when did you start writing a poem? And I was like, well, probably, I think maybe a few months before. He's like, no, nah, you've been writing a poem your whole life. Oh, and I think sometimes we live with, we, we you know, our, our, our whole life is an extension. Well, I know poets, I'm, I can speak for poets and myself as a poet, you know, my life is sort of like an extension uh, of the words that I'm, that I'm trying to work out on the page. And so everything is fair game. The whole concept of my memory, right? And, and what that means, like, what does it mean to grow up in the South? What does it mean to hear certain words, right? And sort of like, and, and then to like come of age in the, on the East Coast and to have a whole different dialect, um, you know, at, at, at my exposure, at, you know, at my access. And so these things are never sort of lost on me as I try to put them all together in some kind of way to sort of talk about certain things. And a lot of times I don't necessarily know the things that I want to talk about until I'm completely finished with the poem. I'm like, oh, I've been trying to get that shit out forever, right? And 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 so, you know, some sometimes some some of the work that I'm most proud of comes during that process right there, right? And that's a hell of a question too. So I just want to say thank you for that question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I, I want to say, um, I mean, your book led me. So the brackets, the braces, I started like, okay, these like a book is like a brace. Um, and as I just, I, I went into a Google slide like mini dissertation with my students about <laughs> your use of punctuation and the right. colon yeah, all of those and things the braces. Mean, I mean, and, the brackets are you know self-contained, how we contain ourselves in boxes. I'm I'm huge on yeah. like how we box ourselves into these constructs. That's right. huge for me. Like, you know, like I think sometimes, you know, like we, even sometimes when we are free, we sort of, free, we free ourselves into another box, right? Into another construct. So sometimes those things mean, some, or the self, right? And sort of like that's sort of hyphenated or, you know, periods. Like, I, I want you to stop there. Really. No, I want you to stop right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you can go. But, mm -hmm. but hold on to that one word, whatever that means. And then you can go. And so mm -hmm. that's what I mean by so I'm trying to direct the reader in a certain kind of way. If the reader gives me that chance, right? And makes that yeah. investment. And then you'll really understand what I'm, you know, I'm really trying to get at. So, yeah. 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 Oh, we're getting time for one more question, um, which was from someone here in the room with us, which I think really gives each of you the chance to just talk about whatever you like. But would each of you please um touch on how you came to the t the title of this part these particular books oh again yeah, randall stole my idea <laughs> <laughs> sure did nah, 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 i'll fuck with you <laughs> now nah, we've been talking we've been talking about these things i'll let you go first and then <laughs> I, you know it's interesting because i think i was related i was wondering how you know what's funny you remember when um when bastards came out right i was gonna call it uh near burn near burden yeah and and i couldn't i i hit up a publisher and um and they incorrectly suggested that it sounded like my previous book you know and it's interesting because um because sometimes you could be ahead of the curve when you reach out to like the companies or whatever you know and and and, and people will kind of try to rationalize why they don't want to support you and, and and sometimes it's you know race, sometimes it's ignorance, and sometimes it's this that they don't have room for you. And I was like, man, this book is completely different from the last book, right? And I was so fucking pissed that um, I called it. So after I was like, fuck y'all, I'm going to law school. 
That was my response. You don't want to publish this shit? I'm going to law school. I don't need y'all. You know what I mean? I don't need to be begging for you to run off a thousand copies of a book for me. Fuck you. And um, I just ruined the whole possibility for this to go inside of prison. But um, <laughs> but so so then what happens though is I, I stepped back and said, was I being brash? And so I hit up somebody I respect. And they was like, oh, this book is dope. And it's completely unlike your previous book. And we love to publish it. But I was like, I'm still going to law school. And I called that book Bastards of the Reagan era instead of near burn, near burden, because I realized there was something about the way that I was naming books from the second book to the from the first book to the second that I had got caught up in the world. You know, Shahid reads his own palm was based on a really idiosyncratic moment of me having three palm readers refuse to read my palm. They were just like, nah, this ain't for you. Like my money doesn't spend here. They was like, nope, it don't. You know, and so that's why I named my book that. But the second book, I was trying to be cute. And so it ended up being Bastards of the Reagan era out of a rejection of the whole paradigm. And I, I remember thinking like, no, like me and the publisher having conversations, like uh, me and Martha Rose, like, you know, you might not get reviewed or, I mean, you sure you want to call it Bastards of the Reagan era? I'm supporting whatever you do. And what was wild is that by calling it Bastards of the Reagan era, I was truer to myself and it was just a much better title. I, I avoided the ways in which writers sometimes run away from clarity. And so when it came time for the next book, you know, I was, I was a lawyer or about to be a lawyer. And I was thinking a lot about what these titles meant. You know, I had a bar ID, but I couldn't remember what it was, but I know my state number by heart. And all of these people in the public was like, don't call somebody a felon, call them formally incarcerated or a returning citizen. And I was like, where the fuck I'm returning from? I, I was never gone. You know, you just chose not to see me. And so I, I named it felon as an act of protest against everybody. <laughs> I mean, it was like it was like it was an act of protest against everybody, and I, and I don't think Randall stole my title, but I think what happens is because we we close, you know, we was on the same wavelength, and he hit it from a different angle, and I think that his title does something else, really, because I think his title is more. I ain't gonna tell you what his title does, but I, I think I think the reason why the two books are dope and companion is because they do do two radically different things, and I, and I think they they are in conversation with each other. And just to follow up since, you know, um, yeah, you, we talk all the time. I mean, I've been knowing all of his books and the titles and the manuscripts and everything. And we talk about these concepts and, um, and I actually didn't even think I was going to write a, a book about prison. I mean, if you, if you look at, I just didn't. And then it just, these, these poems started coming. And then I know, I remember him talking about, you know, his felon book, you know, you know naming it felon for those reasons. And it got me to thinking about, well, if I'm going to go this route with this book, um, then I need to, I want to, you know, I'm going to claim only, because I'm, I'm totally, you know, uh, you know, got an issue with, you know, la the language of incarceration, because I think sometimes it sort of re, re stigmatizes and reincarcerates, you know, those who are trying to break free from that, you know, like, ex you know, expelling and all that. But at the same time, given our situations and given where we are, we do have a platform. We do have somewhere to say this and take ownership of that, right? And so for me, it was like, you know, my, you know, like you say, 289128 was like, that's like memory, like everywhere you go. And if I'm going to write about this and I'm going to talk about these things, then I'm going to claim ownership of that because it's the one time that I could do it and they can't nobody take it away from me. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to use it for something else. And that was sort of my whole idea, you know, about whole idea of 28912 it's a rhetorical thing too like and you know does it does it ever leave does it ever leave you sure you know we're gonna have lies or whatever but at the same time you run my number you run my my social security and they're gonna come up with seven thousand and then it's a whole nother thing and i'm looking at you know i could be looked at a whole different way so i'm that's that's never that's never like you know far from my memory and 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 i just thought that you know, naming the 289128 would be a way to sort of, you know, give license to it, um, to, to like the whole experience while I'm trying to explain to somebody or to, to the reader about the things that we go through on the inside, right? And so that was totally the, that was sort of like totally like the reason um, that I sort of went down that road. And I wanted it to be in such a way that, you know, you're always thinking about the, the number in this sort of way, every time you're looking at a poem, right? If you look, you know, the, two, the 289 one is like really there. 
in plain sight. And so we're never too far away from the reality too. Uh, what it means, you know, to be on the outside with PhDs and law degrees or whatever, still, you know, um, and so what does that mean, right? And so the only thing I know is, 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 is was to, you know, sort of take to take license, take ownership, and you and empower and empower that for something totally different, right? Some something totally different. And like I said, they are totally different books and instead of wise but they do they do they are companion in a way. They do talk to each, in different ways because. In cost, you know, you know, living on, on the inside is not a monolithic thing, right? There are many different things that go on, many different things, right? So, okay. thank you so much. Yeah, it was a real gift to be able to teach these together. Um, Natalie, would you talk about your title a little bit? Yeah, and it's it's always lucky to hear uh, Randall and Dwayne. Uh, kind of talk about the blueprints, the underneath of, of what we get to see. Um, and especially with language, I, th I think it's so important uh, what we are named versus what we name ourselves. You know, what's how language is of so many projections. And so when we have the opportunity to say or to be uh, what we choose to, to um, yeah, what we choose to put out of who or what, or you know what's occurring in, in our being at that moment. Um, with with post-colonial love poem, actually, so Mary, Mary Speaker is here, I think, who did the cover of my book. Um, I think an image, so for me, both of my books, the first book and this book, the title was also part of the way I was seeing the image. I think a lot about the who. So this is, I think, why also it's been lucky to hear Randall and Duane talk about this because I needed the bodies who I'm talking about to, to be forward. Uh, I, don't, I didn't want to let my readers project who these bodies were. And I was thinking a lot about uh, who is the first body at stake in, in this book. Um, and it, it's my own body. So uh, the cover itself for me is very much related physically and tactilely and, and sensually to the title. Um, and I think, you know, as much as like, as much as we want to say in the poetry world, we're comfortable with pleasure and sensuality in a body like mine, we're not, you know, the academy itself is not. What does it mean to be uh, a queer, native, uh, Latina, Latinx, Mexican? You know, where do you rank on centering the white cis male uh, desires? And so, you know, for me, like, this title was one way to, to kind of put two unlike things together. And I feel like I live in that state, that condition of, you know, unlikeness. I'm not trying to find likeness in my life. It, it won't exist, I think, in English and it won't exist in this country, which doesn't also mean I can't bloom and flourish into this, you know, English is also my language. Um, and so for me, that's, that's what it was. Like I wanted to put my body at stake for pleasure. And, and by at stake, I, also, I, I mean also of consequence. So I don't mean at stake always against, like what happens if I can still keep my eye on and be realistic about what's happening in this world and in the English language, and also give myself an opportunity for pleasure in the same moment. Um, and, and that felt really important to me. And another thing I was thinking a lot about was murdered missing indigenous women. Um, you know, who uh, among many other women of color, um, you know, there's no real formal count uh, for that official count for the numbers of, of uh, women, uh, women identifying trans non-binary um, persons who go missing. And so I was thinking a lot about that. What does it mean to, to, uh, uh, to be the agent of pleasure or love or desire and not the object of the violence of those things projected on. Um, and so it felt really lucky for me to be able to, to situate in that. You know, I knew when I wrote that poem that it, it was doing something a little bit different. I tend to use title poems. So my poem, you know, will become the title. Um, and I use that as a lens through the whole book, I think to treat every body in it, the, the most difficult bodies to love, the unknown bodies, the stranger bodies, the state's bodies, the nation's bodies, as a kind of beloved. So a kind of complexity that helped me remember my own tenderness or sensuality with the, with the self first, and then with who else might be in the poem. Um, 
but yeah, the, I mean, those were just some of my thoughts and wonders alongside. And I think just to kind of touch on the idea of love, like I see so much love in Randall and Dwayne's poems, you know, in ways that I think have made, uh, created a kind of capacity for me to, to like, for example, love the brothers or to love the sister, you know, um, and to kind of uh, just, I don't know, dismantle what is goodness in America and, you know, love the way we say love, the way we say, you know, you're good or you're bad. Um, those are all kind of lenses I was trying to look through with the title. Thank you so much. I think that this book, um, and your work in general, you, I mean, it's, it's just, it has done and is doing so much work in the poetry world and all the world's connected is poetry is connected to everything. Um, and it, it, it's, it's like, making this, I don't know, you know, territory of erotic sovereignty. There's this like steamy book, you know, it's really, it's really beautiful. Um, so thank you so much. Um, it's 103. I'm, you know, my English teacher in me is like, wow, we're three minutes over. I'm so sorry, but um, thank you so much. I don't know, Jen, Jen, do you want to say something to close us? No, just thanks. You all, we have a tradition at the end of our events to turn your mics on and say hi to all the fellows and uh, the women inside. So feel free to um, just turn your mic on and thank the poets and say hello to the students who will see your faces soon. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Young thank you. and talented. Thank you, Randall. Appreciate it. Hey, students. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you guys. Beautiful. Well, thank get you. your shots. Yeah. Yeah. We miss you guys. Gracias. Dream well. Dream well. Ciao. Be well. We see you. We see you. Yeah. Hi, Nelly. See you.